Okay, I think we'll start. Uh, so first of all, welcome. Uh, my name is Anthony. I have the great pleasure to welcome you to Ethereum Meetup Poland. Um, summer edition. Uh, I am actually very happy that so many people could arrive today. Uh, so just a quick question, who is the, fir the first time here attending our meetup? Okay, that's a lot of people. Um, so not to prolong everything, I have the great pleasure to introduce to you Alex Kempa, Kempa which uh, he will talk and present you a, a little bit of a different approach to um, economic um, products and uh, how to realize far off, like economy on top of a blockchain. Um, in the meantime, solving some very interesting computational problems with it. So uh, please uh, give some noise to Alex. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Can you hear me? Is the microphone working? Okay. Closer. Okay. How about now? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, let me just say a few words in Polish. Bardzo się cieszę, że jestem w Warszawie. Po raz pierwszy tam prezentuję mój projekt tutaj w Polsce i, no, i w takim specjalnym miejscu. Okay, so thank you very much, first of all, to Edworks um, for organizing this, uh, this event. We're going to be talking about the project called Sokoba. Um, I will deviate a little bit from the, pro, um, from the program that was published on Meetup, because basically it's uh, a bit difficult to understand this project if, um, if I don't explain so, uh, a few things about, about money. So we'll start a very quick a crash course on money. Oops, yeah. So first of all, we all use money on an almost daily basis. We use this word, but the word means many things to different people. Here we're going to focus on trying to make some, no, get to some definitions. The main distinction is going to be between money things and money tokens. Let's start at the beginning. If you look back um, in human history, okay, like uh, hundreds of thousands of years, um, it were, there were, people were sharing. There was not much private property. What private property there was, was basically stuff that, you, that people had on their bodies. Okay, amulets, talismans, stuff like that. Jewelry, basically. And um, there probably is a good likelihood that what we today call money came from this, from these personal items which you didn't share with others. It was personal property. And actually, if you look at the, the image, um, until quite recently, um, here's an example from Africa, money beads, for example, here there were carries, they were used as money and as basically jewelry at the same time. So this first type of money, I call money things. At the beginning, there were physical things, carry shells, wampum in uh, North America, embroidered cloth, you had grain, you had metals, you had all kinds of stuff that somehow got standardized in some ways and then was used for exchange, let's say, okay, in different ways. Now what's important to understand is when you read somewhere <clears throat> in some magazine and, and you see, oh, they used stones for money or the Indians, American Indians, used um, shells as money. Well, it's not the same usage as we use, okay? So we had some of these sort of money things that were used for purely ceremonial purposes. Some of them were used for purely social purposes, okay? Some were used for exchanging goods. So the, the range of usage varied enormously and only part of it 
more or less corresponds to some extent to what we would associate with, with money, okay? So some of this so-called money that, that people write about are actually just valuable um, artifacts. Okay, so when did modern money emerge? Modern money emerged between four and 5,000 years ago in, <clears throat> in um, Mesopotamia. We're not sure about China, but probably it was, was not China, probably. So people gradually understood that you can actually, instead of all the time using physical artifacts, you could actually start using promises of these money things. And therefore, the concept of money token appeared. A money token is a promise of a money thing. A banking system emerged in, in Sumer, Mesopotamia. Initially, let's say 5,000 years ago, it was the temples that started doing banking. And afterwards, commercial banks appeared. And you, you basically already, 4,000 years ago at least, you had banks, you had current accounts, you had trade loans, you had the equivalent of checks, um, all kinds of stuff. You had virtual money. They didn't have coins, right? Um, they used clay tablets because they didn't have paper either. And what was actually very interesting in this, in this um, Sumer culture is that during the, the few centuries where these things was really booming, women played quite an important role in banking and in business. And then when things got <laughs> a bit downhill, um, well, there were less women there. They had tamper-proof debt notes. That's very interesting. They were like the um, terms of an IOU. And, oh, who, who doesn't know what an IOU is? IOU is a debt. I-O-U. It's a debt certificate. Okay? So what they had, they had debt certificates. And in order to prevent tampering of the terms, inside a kind of encasing, there was another clay element which confirmed what was outside. So you couldn't change the outside and change the inside, because to change the inside, you'd have to break the tablet. So this was quite a cool technique they used. All right. So what's important to know, and we're getting to the crux of this thing, that a money token, that's basically commercial money. Okay, that's real money. Why is it so important? Now, the fact that, of course, money means it's widely accepted, that, you know, it's standardized, it's fungible, all that, it's, it's normal, that's the money we know. What's important is it's only with this kind of money, with credit money, with commercial money, that you get economic progress, rapid economic progress, because the the money tokens are decoupled from the amount of money things that, are, that, are in the, that exist. All right? That's important. That's what drives business and the economy. So here, once again, the distinction. Um, and let me just note here, after a remark before, that barter has nothing to do with it. Money did not <laughs> originate with barter. Okay? Fine. So a money thing is initially a physical thing. Okay? You agree on some characteristic. It can be owned, of course. You can own a piece of gold. You can own a, a bead of uh, calories. Okay? And the definition of money things can actually be extended very easily, very readily, to cryptocurrencies. You can own them. Now, a money token is a claim on someone. You cannot own that. You can own a banknote, but there is a contract, uh, contract behind. So the ownership is not of the banknote, it's you are part, party to a contract, okay? So you cannot own money. Not really, not in a physical sense. And the other very, very important thing is that a money token is denominated in something else. It could be a money thing or it could be a virtual thing. So it could be a money token denominated, denominated in silver or it could be a money token denominated in euro. So a five euro note is a money token denominated in euro. It's a bit confusing because the money and the, 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 the currency are the same. We have a special case of coins, which came much later, okay, about a 1,500 years after, after banking got invented, well, at least. Um, so tokens have characteristics of both money things and money tokens. And depending on how much different metal, uh, uh, the metal value, they can be more of the one 
or more of the other. So very quick on coins. So coins are really ir irrelevant. What you need to understand about coins is that when you have a gold coin, for example, from uh, Athens, okay, the value of the coin was not because of the gold. It was the gold that showed that the coin was valuable. Think of a Rolex watch. Do you know what, how much a gold Rolex watch costs? Anyone here know? Okay, I think it's around 30,000. I'm not sure, but around there. Do you know how much the gold in a gold Rolex is worth? Anyone? Uh, probably, a, probably a thousand. Thousand, thereabouts. Okay? The gold shows the value. The value does not derive from the gold. And that has always been the case for coins. Almost always. Except when people in Europe tried to actually link the gold to the coin and it didn't work so well. Gold standards, again, important to know that it's a reasonably recent phenomenon. In antiquity, there were no gold standards. And what you have to understand, is also important, is that even when we had a gold standard, most of the money was credit money. Very important. Okay, so there's a guy called Mitchell Innes who understood all of this uh, a century ago. Credit is the essence of money, okay? It, when, once you take away the sort of stuff that the, the beliefs, the, the fact that some people just think there's gold or something else, it's basically credit. A certain type of credit, a high credit, of course. Now, let's go back to credit. Throughout history, credit was pervasive. I mean, everything in business is done, everything. Most business is done on credit, and historically has been done on credit. You had tallies when the, the British king, the English king was paying his suppliers. He was paying with pieces of wood. That was credit, okay? Uh, when, when the tax collectors in England came back with the taxes to London, the carts were full of wooden sticks, okay? Credit. The medieval fairs were all about credit. We'll get to that. Merchants issued tokens, and we had lots of credit systems everywhere. Everywhere you look, and you have business, and you've got human commerce, you have credit. These are just some examples that I have no time to go into. into. So today, um, actually, no, I'll just go back because there's a very funny one. In 1970, in um, Ireland, the banks closed. They didn't close for just a day or a week. They closed for something like six months. And you know what? People started writing little IOUs everywhere, and the economy continued to function without banks. It was extraordinary. And, and lots of trade was done in uh, pubs. So people went to see, oh, do you know this guy? Um, you know, is he a good credit? Superb story, read, read it up. So, if you take a historical perspective, the special situation that we're in now is that in history there was always a, big, a, a large variety of money. First of all, much more credit was used and there were many monies circulating. All right? And people are used to that. Uh, and again, there's reasonably recent examples. In, in the early 1900s, before the Federal Reserve, if someone went from New Orleans to New York with dollars, New Orleans dollars, they would not be accepted in New York. He'd have to go to a bank with $100 from New Orleans. He would get maybe $97 in New York dollars. That's how it was. So this variety has disappeared. Money has become monolithic. Now, in our societies, Money equals bank credit. That's what money is. Okay? It's one type. So the role of banks, and again, that's very relevant to Sikoba because this is something that we do in Sikoba. What is a bank? A bank is a credit conversion mechanism, engine, whatever you want to call it. That's all it is. The bank, you go to the bank and give the bank your IOU, and the bank, in return, when you, when, when you make a loan, the bank will return its IOU. And the bank IOU is called money and will be accepted by everyone. By everyone. So that is what a bank does. 
it's an essential role and it's more and more essential because money is all we use because we don't use credit so much anymore so we need the banks more than more more, more than ever okay in germany until about 30 years ago companies used ious quite a lot and then the banks went and said hey we can do this for you and they offered them super deals on bank credit and German companies stopped using IOUs and now they're dependent on the banks. That's the trend, okay? Um, I have written a book, a booklet, it's not so much, but a little booklet about some of these issues, okay? So, right, so we, ha we are in this monolithic monetary system. We have partly forgotten how to use credit, but Does any of you have any problems with that? I mean, you've got money, you've got credit cards. It all works quite nicely. Okay, so why am I complaining? Well, that's because you're in Europe. And lots of people in the world do not have these instruments that we have. So, just come back here once. We're talking about, about about half the world's population is underbanked. Half. Probably a bit more even. So, just to give some examples of the costs for people in developing countries, for companies in developing countries. Um, microfinance is a, very, is a great idea. So actually, for, for, for many companies, it's a, it's a, it's a deal, you know, they, it saves the, the livelihood to be able to get a small loan, but it's expensive. It's the global average for microloans is 35% per annum interest, which is great for these guys because if they go to informal money lenders, the interest gets up to 1,000%. There are places in the world where if, you, if you're desperate, you're a desperate small business and you actually need cash, you will be end up paying 1% per day. You do the math, it gets to 1,000% a year. And then there are all these guys who have no access to financing at all. Zilch. Then you have these success stories. M-Pesa in um, Kenya and in the countries around Kenya, where people have uh, uh, got this new system of sending money via their smartphones. And I'm, Mind you, they, you have to have money first to be able to send it. But for them, it was a great thing. Everyone's talking about it. What a great and they paid over 10% in commissions on small tra transactions. It's basically light, life out there, out there, financial life, okay, in the third world is not so easy. Okay, it's tough. So what do we want to do, Mr. Koba? Well... Our system, we're basically going back to, we look at history, how things used to be, and what we propose is payment based on trust. You don't need money, and you don't need a third party. Okay? Basically, you, you can do a lot of things with credit, okay? even if you don't have money. That's the point. Sometimes you do need money, it's good to have money, but if you, if you don't have money, or if you have not enough money, you can do lots of things with credit. So how does it work? I'll get through the mechanics. And the reason I did this lengthy introduction is if you've listened a bit, then the mechanics of all this will become, will, will look pretty obvious. So we have the usual suspects, Alice and Bob, right? So Bob trusts Alice and gives, gives her a credit line. So nothing happens yet. Bob simply says, hey, Alice, I trust you up to 500 euros, for example. So what, what happens now? Well, nothing at the beginning, because if Alice never goes to Bob and wants to buy something from Bob, nothing happens ever. But let's say Alice goes to Bob's shop and buys something for $200 or euros. Now Alice owes Bob 200 Why did it happen? Because Bob had agreed beforehand, because he knows her. Okay, That's simple credit. That's how people throughout many, many centuries when they went to the store to buy something, they went to the baker, they didn't pay. They said, ah, I need a bread, I need this. Write it down. That's how things worked. 
people work uh, for many, many centuries, in, also in Europe, people lived with very little money. So there may be conditions. That's normal. So let's say Bob says, well, sure, I'll give you a credit line, but you'll have to pay some interest. Okay. And, well, as in real life, debts need to be repaid. And one of the ways is by actually paying after a certain delay. So Bob may say, well, after 30 days, if there's no offsetting transaction, you actually have to come up with the cash. What's all with money? What's money? Money is bank credit. So the Alice has 500 euros at the bank, which means exactly that the bank owes Alice 500. And so Alice makes a bank transfer to Bob, and now the bank owes Alice 300 and owes Bob 200. Bob is happy because the debt is cleared between Alice and Bob. Okay? Now, so far it wasn't very interesting because we only had Alice and Bob and they know each other and they just, you know, they could go on transacting forever. Um, but if I can only transact with people I know, you know, I may have lots of friends but it's not enough. I mean, it's not that many people. I know them anyway. Credit conversion comes in. Is when I can start transaction, transacting with people whom I don't know, but let's say someone I know is trusted by someone else. The simplest case of credit conversion, Alice goes to Charles's shop. She wants to buy something. And uh, she says, well, can I, you know, can you write it down? And Charles says, no, I don't know you. Um, but then they find out that they know Bob. And Charles trusts Bob, and Bob trusts Alice. A transaction is possible. Okay, so what happens? Alice pays Charles via Bob, but actually Charles has no exposure towards Alice. Charles only sees Bob. She says, ah, Bob owes me 200. That's fine. I accept that. I don't accept Alice's 200. I accept Bob's 200. So now, Charles, uh, Bob has a debt towards Charles, and Alice has a debt towards Bob. And for this to happen, Bob must have actually accepted to do credit conversion for Alice beforehand. It's not automatic, okay? This has to be accepted, and there may be some fees involved in all this, okay? Bob may say, I'll do credit conversion. I'll, I'll let you use my network, but you'll pay a commission. Could happen, you know, in business. Then the second concept is, we've just seen credit conversion. It's fine. It allows people to transact out, outside of the immediate circle of trust. The optimization comes in when existing exposures are in the system, someone new joins the system, and the system will try and find uh, opti uh, an optimal path. Sorry, I, um, I'm not on the right slide. Let me just backtrack a second. If there are more than one possibilities to pay, the system will find the cheapest for you. So you want to pay someone, and you, there may be many possible intermediaries with different costs, so the system will try to find the cheapest one for you, the buyer, okay, for the, the one who takes the credit. And then, not only that, the idea is that once an exposure or a set of exposures exist, the system will, on a continuous basis, try to optimize these exposures to make it cheaper for the people who actually bor are borrowers. Okay? This is the optimization. Alice has paid Charles the $200, 200 euros, and she's paying some interest. As you can see, between Bob and Charles, there is some interest, for which Alice is responsible. That's why it's not so simple, because Bob is paying interest to Charles, for which Alice is responsible. Now Damien joins the system, and it so happens that Charles does not charge Damien interest, and Damien trusts Alice, but maybe only for, you know, this is, this, the, the amounts are smaller. So the system, the goal of, of this, this thing is, I said, optimization, to keep costs down. The system will rebalance positions to make it cheaper for Alice, because Alice is the one who took the credit, who is the debtor. Okay? So you can see that 100 euros were moved from the top line to the bottom line, but 100 is the maximum, because Charles only trusts Damien up to 100 euros. Okay? The idea is that this optimization will happen in real time in the system. Clearing happens when you have circular 
um, in, in a graph, you've got, you've got, circ you've got circular sort of subgraphs where you can clear things, okay? Here you have, for example, in, okay, in a set of, let's say, three companies and they, one owes the other, and you can actually delete debt. And in the end, you can see that the outstanding amount of debt is much smaller than the total debt. Um, when I was presenting this uh, last year in Paris, and I think it was more or less at this stage that a guy sort of waved as an elderly Chinese guy. I later found out he's a, I think, professor of Chinese um, uh, history at the Sorbonne. And he said, hey, you know what? We have this in Paris, in the Chinese quarter, in Chinatown. You have groups of small businesses that work together all year long. I was very surprised. So they all do business with each other. For, for an entire year, and they all write it down, and once a year they all come together, sit down, and, and clear the books. And apparently cheating is, like, doesn't happen, because cheating would have such grave social consequences that it's inimaginable. Yeah? So this is not just stuff that happened a long time ago, or that's happening in some strange countries. <laughs> it's happening now in Europe, at least in one example. And there were even, he said that there were several of these networks uh, operating in Paris uh, today. So what's our vision? It's reasonably clear that, you know, we, we all know that we have lots of payments and remittances. We ha that exists already. It's a, huge, it's a huge market and, you know, the cryptocurrency space um, is partly trying to address that. Um, and I would say thanks to cryptocurrencies, partly thanks to cryptocurrencies, the costs for remittances are, are coming down. That's good. We have, um, more recently, the emergence of P2P loans. My figures are not exactly so recent, but it's growing very, very fast. And in China, it's, I think, I think in China alone, it's already reached 100 billion, but we don't know because China is a special case. And we think that the P2P IOU market, that's the next big thing in finance. It's the next big thing because just about no one is doing it and the potential is just enormous, okay? Why is it so big? Why is the potential big? We just looked at one country, although I'd say Bangladesh is probably not our main target at the beginning. In many developed countries, you have a large number of small and micro enterprises. Why is that? Well, let me just ask you a question. Who here is an employee? Wow, two employees, three? Okay. Who, okay, who is... N no, no, who, okay, so who is not an employee here? Who is self-employed? Okay, guys, you're not the right audience for this. <laughs> okay, anyway, point taken. The fact is that in our countries, in developed, country, developing, uh, in develop, developed countries, okay, a majority of people are employees. It's normal. The employees, they know that the teachers, that they may be civil servants. Um, the, the amount of self-employed is not so large. In developing countries, just about everyone. I mean, a, a majority is basically working in family businesses, having some small trade. You have much, much more individual individuals trading, and that's why I have a hard time explaining my project in Europe, because employees and civil servants don't understand this. Someone who has a business understands credit. They understand why it's important, okay? And in Bangladesh, in a country of 160 million people, you've got 34 million small and micro businesses. It's a lot. It's a huge volume. It's a huge uh, potential of users. So the use cases are, I think if you <laughs> followed this, it's pretty clear. Main goal is to jumpstart local economies, improve them, you inject some credit, give them the right tool. Okay, now, why is blockchain? I haven't yet mentioned why blockchain is important. Blockchain gives the certainty that what is registered is there. Okay, if you have a verbal agreement, if you have something on a piece of paper, it's complicated. You, you know, the other party may renege. Someone may try to say, oh, no, it was 100, no, it was 200. Here we have a blockchain to register all of these debts at every single step. step. And our goal, of course, is to make these, um, you know, 
be valid in court. It's a proof. Okay, so you, you can't cheat. Once you engage in, you have a debt, you have a debt. Okay, it can be an alter alternative to microcredit systems. That's pretty obvious. Um, business networks could be interested. I would say potentially even in, developing, in developed countries, in industrial countries, even though that's not an immediate goal. Um, ad hoc credit systems. You know, when there was, a, when there was um, the crisis in Greece a few years ago, I saw a film about that. They basically were doing like a Sikoba with pieces of paper, okay, in the marketplace. Amazing stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, the papers are flying around and I'm sure it wasn't easy to, you know, to clear everything to, to make sure that nothing was forgotten. Um, I'll skip some of the technical things. So it's going to be a federated blockchain because the data stored, you know, the debt is, these are, this is debt of real people, real companies. You can't make this open to the world. That's pretty obvious. So you have to have trusted nodes, institutions, trusted groups running these, uh, these nodes on a network. Um, there's data privacy issues. I'll skip that too, but it's pretty obvious. Ah, here's something that's of, that we're thinking of, and I think it's of interest to, to some blockchain projects, is the account recovery. Today, one of the problems is you have uh, your private key. When you lose it, you lose it. It's gone. We want, would like to find a process by which you can actually recover your account. And this can be done via biometric. If you have a very strong biometric identification, then basically your biometric identification should actually allow you to recover your account. Um, and we're talking to some guys in Germany, and, they, and the, the voice identification is quite, is quite good, actually. It's apparently potentially a better better certainty than face, um, just the, 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 the photos or the video of face. Okay, voice is, is something we're looking at. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea of the stage, we're, not, we're starting to look at, I mean, we have some interfaces. It's still very much at an early demo stage. What's important here, and we'll get to that, log in with Facebook, okay? Log in with Google. We want a system where initially people can use it without having a private key. That's, I think for us, it's very important. Um, there'll be, of course, which, uh, like login, I mean, identify yourself uh, with your face, your voice, etc. But to log in via standard methods without asking about keys, about passphrases, I think that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a killer idea for mass market blockchain product. And then once they're hooked, once they actually use the system and they want to use it for more, for, for higher amounts, then you'll tell them, okay, now you need a private key. Now you need to go through another, another process. But then you're in there already. You've got, you've, you have outstanding balances. You have your friends in there, etc. That's important. So, you know, then we have a fast payment. That, that's already sort of works. Well, anyway, uh, that, that's just a fake. Fast payment means, look, two people stand in front, front of each other and say, okay, Download this bloody thing, and it takes, takes a few minutes. We really, really want to make this payment. We don't want to go through a process where you open a credit line, you know, and, 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 and because normally it's a bit of a process where you have to first create a credit line so that someone else can pay you. And what we want to do, if you want to get started, we just pay. And it creates your credit line, it does everything, and boom, I owe you money. That's it. Fast payment. You know, and then you can, of course, look at the IOUs that are outstanding. Um, you can, um, the system, and here again, the examples are a bit ridiculous, but okay. Um, the system gives you options. So you, you say, I want to pay someone. And the system says, okay, depends on for how long, etc. There'll be different, a different cost to that. Okay. Um, do I want something for 10 days? Do I want something for 25 days? Depending on the, on the time horizon, there may be different fees involved. And hopefully, we, we hope that actually people will often grant this for free for a certain amount of time. That's the goal. That for 15 days, 30 days, people who know each other will simply say, okay, for that amount of time, it's free, and then afterwards, you, you may have to pay. Then you have, you know, okay, oh, let me show you. Well, the usual dashboards and, and history of what's, what's happening. So this is under development uh, as, as we speak. Um, right. So now I've done num um, point number one of the, of the plan. 
Uh, and given that uh, Ed works have, has uh, told me that I can have four hours, I think we're good. We're on track. There's only uh, two and a half hours left here. Good. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny, huh? <laughs> no. So we're getting uh, to the to S nodes, which is um, something that uh, Malik has heard of already, but it was called Z nodes uh, when, when we talked about this. Um, I'll try and be reasonably brief here. It's, it's, um, so this is really something that happened while we were working on our, on our main project. We knew we want this on a blockchain. Let's say that two and a half years ago, very beginning, you know, we were blue-eyed and, and etc. We said, well, what about Ethereum? Well, we very quickly understood that that's not an option. Um, we looked at other things, what about Hyperledger, etc. And every, every platform we looked at was not ideal. And in the end, we said, well, let's, let's see what we can do. You know, let's see if, you know, is there something... Um, actually, you know, in, while we started already on this, we found out about Tendermint and Bubble. Bubble is something new. You, may or may not have heard about it. It's like a son of Tendermint. So these are good. So we, said, we saw that what they were trying to do is close to what, um, what we need, but not quite. So it, it didn't, we didn't just stop and say, oh, we're going to use Babel, and that's fine, that's the solution. It's unfortunately not. So we continued. And so we came up with um, basically, in the end, just a couple, couple ideas. Uh, that, that we found important. The first one is, um, I'm not going to go exactly through this whole chart here. The idea is, it's this login that I showed you before. The user goes through the normal access layer, AWS Cognito, he gets registered via, via email, he gets his SMS, he goes through a normal login procedure, and then he can start using the system. Because we have a gateway, a trusted gateway, that will actually sign his transactions for him. That means that our transaction format must support it, right? That means that if you look here, and in this, in this, in this, uh, it's just a fake transaction, it's our, it's our format. If you look in the first sort of yellow um, uh, part that's marked in yellow, you see that the credential, there is no public key there. So this user has, has submitted a transaction without credentials, but you can see that he received, just in the line below, he's received a token, and that token means, ah, uh, it's from a gateway. You can see that there is no signature from the user because he doesn't have a private key yet. He cannot sign. The gateway is signed for him, and it's a trusted gateway. So the gateway certifies, yes, it is this user. So the transaction, you can actually process it. That means also that the user account cannot be the public key of the user because some users will not have public keys. We have to come up with something else. Right now, we... Um, we we put in a UUID for a user, okay? So it requires a different transaction structure. We're also thinking of um, making the system open in the sense that if you already have a private key, a private Ethereum key, well, why can't you use that to sign your transactions? You say, I've got this account and I want to link my Ethereum account to this account. What would be the advantage of that? Well, you need one less private key, that's one thing, but your Ethereum account could well be linked to some identity service that we trust. In which case, we can just look up your information. You don't have to go through KYC. So there's all kinds of advantages of allowing a variety of signatures. Okay? Okay, this is not so interesting. It's a gossip player. It's, it's just a choice. We have two options. Everything goes through trusted nodes or there is also the option of going directly th to the nodes, but th there is an option of going only through the trusted nodes to, s to, uh, to make the system more secure. Um, then the application layer looks like this, and if any of you have looked at Tendermint, this should be familiar, um, but there's some differences. Here you see that all the images come into the engine, there is a consensus module inside the engine, and then the the engine, okay, which is the consensus engine, talks to the application through some API or some Golang interface. There's a, there's a state, there's a database. And the engine also records the transactions and the results, the changes in the world state, potentially just the hashes of the world state 
in the blockchain. The application does need to see the blockchain. So what's, what's different about this? And, and, and uh, let's say something like Tendermint. First of all, you don't need the user interaction layer. If you look at the client application, in something like Tendermint, the application has to manage the interaction with the users. It has to take in the, uh, the messages sent, and it's, it's not, it shouldn't be its role to do that. And plus, it's dangerous because it exposes the application to the, to the world. Okay? In our case, the application only receives, only communicates with the engine. Second, and we'll get to that also, the consensus module, I think, would be good to have it pluggable. The two projects that I know, as I said, Tendermint and Babel, they have predefined consensus engines. The consensus is very tightly bound. You could probably try and, you know, fork the project and try and get another, but it's, it's, that's not the design. We would like a design where we can actually plug the consensus engine, okay? Um, and there's reasons such as, for some projects, if you have, for example, a very high trust in your nodes, and you say, well, okay, we don't need to have, you know, to fear uh, uh, even one-third attacks. Okay, we mostly want to just pre prevent failures, and, you know, once in a while there may be someone trying to, to do a Byzantine thing, but it's, we're fine with even 20% of the nodes, which is possible. You do a very fast consensus. If you have a very good network, you do one consensus. If you have a slow network, you do another consensus because in slow networks you need something that's resistance to asynchronous, asynchronous, you know, stuff, you know, asynchronous uh, protocol, etc. And then, of course, the sort of holy grail is that you that you switch, and the, the real holy grail, is, it, grail would be that the system automatically switches when necessary. But okay, let's not go too far. At least you can choose your protocol. That's our goal. Um, and then you've got the security of going through some external service, and you have the capacity, the fact that going, for example, through, through uh, AWS Cognito, okay, some crypto guys will not like it because it's Amazon, but, okay, if we're targeting millions of users, because this is a system where we want to be ready for it, okay, we don't, we don't want a system where we, you know, we say, oh, we have 1,000 users, 10,000, and then the, the day when we have 100,000, the system breaks. We want at every stage something that can handle volume. And with, if we have Amazon on one layer, we're good. We can, Amazon can handle millions of users. That's fine. We, just, we don't have to solve all the problems at once. Okay? Um, and finally, come back to um, consensus. One of the reasons that um, we were doing all this is that we didn't find a platform that did the kind of consensus that we needed, or that we wanted, let's say. Um, so, for Sokoba, and we will have, well, we've started on, on the architecture of consensus, we'll have a multi-stage consensus, okay? You first have the traditional consensus where you order messages and you put them into blocks. That, we know how to do that. Okay, that's not a problem. Obviously, we're not going to, to do proof of work. We're rather, you know, going to do some, some Byzantine uh, protocol. And one of the great things is that because of Bitcoin, because of this blockchain movement, there are now many, many more people than before writing papers, researching this. So it's fine. We, we have a number of good candidates for that. But then once we have our, um, our blocks of transactions, we have to apply these transactions to the system. And this is an optimization problem. If we have 10,000 users, we'll be fine. But with a million users or more, we'll have start having problems. It's, it's, at some stage, this is probably going to be a hard mathematical problem because we want con continuous optimization of a huge graph with dependencies, etc. So that's where this uh, idea comes of um, our optimization uh, consensus protocol where we said, well, let's use the power of the nodes. Let's not have every node do the same. We know the world state. We agree on a world state. World state is simply a database of, of the, the graph as it is and all the exposures, etc. And the, you know, ex every exposure has conditions, okay? Um, so it's not just a simple exposure. It's, if you change an exposure, you have to also 
count the, 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 the effect on interest rates on fees. We know the transactions we're going to process. So every node gets the same initial configuration. We, that's one step of the consensus. That's the easy step. Afterwards, the idea is to give every node a certain number of seconds, maybe just a couple seconds, and every node independently looks for a solution. And then, and then there's the tricky part where we, we're not sure yet how, uh, what's the best way to do it. We stop the race, everyone declares, shows what they have found, and the node that found the best solution wins. We need, what we need for that is a kind of measuring function, okay, an efficiency function globally, so that, of course, finding this, this best solution is hard, but once a node presents a solution and says, oh, you know, my, my result gets, gets this mark, okay, on efficiency, and everyone says, oh, well, mine's lower, the verification, as usual, is, is much simpler. So every node works to find the best possible solution. They declare the solutions. They, they see who got the best solution. They all verify that solution, and that becomes the solution of that block. And then we continue. Okay? Here we use the power of the nodes, and these will be very powerful nodes, so we can actually really get much better optimization, and much faster optimization than if we had all the nodes do the same work. And basically that is, I wanted to keep that simple because we, we had some, uh, the first part was a bit longer. So that's me, and uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, before I, I finish, just uh, I guess an announcement, I would say. We're looking for, um, in, in no particular order, uh, people who are interested in uh, research on monetary theory, students, okay, for, for, to help with research, write articles. Uh, we look for supporters and participants, you know, f for IT, developers who are interested in this kind of stuff. Um, we use Go and Crystal Lang. I mean, we want to use Crystal Lang. Ever, ever, anyone heard of Crystal here? It's like Ruby, but uh, fast. Uh, and uh, I know it's an oxymoron, but uh, um, and yeah, and we're looking for contacts in developing countries. Who knows? Okay. And uh, we're also in a, in a fundraising mode, uh, and obviously, some stage we'll uh, hope to do either an ICO or some kind of uh, something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, okay, raise your hands and I will run. Uh, you uh, stated uh, very accurately that uh, in developed uh, countries, it's not very popular that people are self-employed, self while it's popular in developing countries. So uh, don't you think that uh, Sikoba goes against normal trend that, okay, now in uh, uh, Bangladesh there is a lot of, uh, of uh, self-employed, but this number will be decreasing as this country will be progressing. Or you, you believe that simply this third world, because partially we see that in the world, that they will find their another path, that they will not be in 30 years like US now, but totally different. Um, yes. Well, I think to answer the first question about why are there so many um, micro enterprises, because they have no choice. It's 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 not. A, you know, if, if these guys could get well-paid job as employees in offices, okay, or become civil servants, they would. They just can't. Is right. You mean the, 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 the idea that they will eventually become like us and... Uh, yes, that I, they will look, become I don't, I don't ordinary know. employees. I, I don't know. It's not, I would say uh, it's not that relevant at this stage for, for my project. I just know that this project can probably help them. And that, that the, the people I uh, talk to uh, or talk to who, who were in these contexts, they, they understand why this is useful. So at this stage, um, it, I think it can help them. What they do with it is another thing. I, I frankly think that that, that Sikoba can, can be used in Europe. I just, you know, I think it would be useful even in Europe, but people have a harder time seeing it because they just, 
you know, paying is with money, right? So uh, it's a kind of yeah, because because ideology. Uh, there is a time involved in in also developing this project, and then like uh, looks like time works against you. Oh, that I think that uh, trend uh, is slow. Uh, I mean, if it would take us 50 years to build Sukoba, maybe you're right, but it's not going to take us 50 years. Okay. Great. Thank you. I wanted to ask you to what extent you're using smart contracts on your platform and basically if yes, I mean, to what, the, what is their role, what they're doing, you know, and what is the value added for for the participants. All right. I mean, the we're not really in a in a context of it's a vocabulary issue, a vocabulary issue because typically um, what we call smart contracts, um, you know, it's stuff that's much closer to, to the blockchain layer. So in Ethereum, the blockchain layer and the EVM and the smart contracts and everything is very tightly coupled. coupled. Um, we're in a completely different architecture where we have a normal application. I mean, this is, we could say that the application is a smart contract, but it's a traditional, big, powerful application. It needs to be powerful because it needs to process, uh, you know, large amounts of transactions. And it has a, it will have a, to have a, you know, a, a database, um, a modern database. The only thing is that all the transactions, the result of the computation at every step will get, the result will be hashed and, and recorded in the blockchain. The, okay. okay. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I would like to ask what is the minimum uh, level of infrastructure that uh, you require from the user? Because I've got a feeling that um, this stuff uh, from uh, your end can be done on uh, basically Lightning Network uh, Bitcoin with a more established token, essentially. What users need is to download an app and you know, uh, create an account and start using it. Uh, I don't see how you do, could do this with Lightning Network. So I mean, we need a... We need a we need a big database and we need a pretty complex application to, to manage all this thing. I mean, you could, you could possibly, you know, if you go on doing these blocks here, you could possibly take these blocks and to have an additional layer of, let's say, security, you could try and take these blocks and maybe put them on an existing larger, um, you know, blockchain platform just to, yeah, it's like a notary, an additional notary. No, I mean, uh, Bitcoin is a payment network already, and when people need an interface to cash, they can just use something like a card, like Monaco, for example. Okay, well, this is a system for people who don't have cash. They don't have Bitcoin, they don't have money. You, this is a system for paying without money. Okay, so if you have Bitcoin, okay, you, don't need, I mean, you may not need this because you've, you, you, if you're fine. This is for people potentially who have no money. This is paying without money. It's paying with credit. You pay, I pay you in the sense that you write down that I owe you something. I don't need any money. Alice goes to Bob and Bob writes it down. That's what this is. And the value added is that it's written down and certified on a blockchain so that Alice cannot say later, oh, no, I, I, I forgot, I, I don't remember. Okay. Oh. What blockchain technology technology you want to use? Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's not uh, Ethereum, not a hyperledger. So, what is the solution? The, the, I'd say the the blockchain layer here is the least of our problems. The the once we have transactions in a world state, we hash the stuff. Okay, we could not not just that we can actually take the transactions themselves because they're not. Uh, that typically not super complicated. Let's see if I can go back to this thing that shows a, a, a transaction. Okay, you can hash the transactions that are in the block. You can hash the output of, of uh, the hash of the world state. 
you take that, you hash it, and link it to the previous thing. I mean, this is, it's easy. It's you, we write our own blockchain. I'd say that, that is not a problem. That's, uh, you learn that in, in blockchain programming classes. So we don't need another uh, platform to do that for us. Okay, thank you. Okay. You mentioned before that uh, you don't need to create a private key to create a transaction. And the company somehow certifies that the user ha has a credit. How do you do that? And aren't you afraid of scams? For example, someone can ask you to certify and then he will go away. Okay, so there's two, two different questions. Um, the, the, the gateways, okay, um, we need someone certainly to, to certify the transaction. So the gateway is some kind of trusted organization that has a trusted computer. Okay, so that's all it is. It's just a very trusted computer. Okay. Now, okay, this may be something that, that we haven't um, uh, addressed um, again uh, enough, the question of trust. In the system, all the people that, that will end up owing you money, you will know them and you will have specifically set limits for them. You will never in the system, in Sikoba, you will never have an administration where you wake up, look at your smartphone or on your, at your web interface and say, whoa, you know, Alan owes me money. I have an exposure to him. I don't know him. This will never happen by design. You, only people whom you have approved beforehand will owe you money. And you will say, well, this guy I, I, I trust up to so much and this other guy, and you know them personally. The assist, nothing will, pre will pre prevent you really to give a credit line to someone you don't know, but by design, we want to discourage that. You give credit lines. If you're a company, you will give credit lines to your suppliers, to your partners, etc. You will never have exposure to someone you don't know. Basic principle, most important. Another question? Maybe I missed something, but uh, how do you actually settle that in the end? And uh, th does it like this application does it, or does it happen outside and you need to verify it? Like, and I may be confused by the concept of managing this without the concept of money that you that you mentioned. Uh, money is but I'm just trying to imagine how the, the, the actual settlement yep. happens. Well, it's basically, we have seen some of it here already. The, the first settlement is if there is no other um, possibility, that you use money. You use money as the settlement of last resort. Here, Alice owes 200 euros to Bob. And after a while, you know, the, the, these credit lines, okay, have terms, have conditions, and Bob's condition was, for example, 30 days. What could have happened is that on day 29, Bob comes to Alice's shop and buys something, and that would then settle potentially this debt, and then they would be clear. But if that doesn't happen, then Alice actually has to pay him, either in the system, which is the optimal um, option, but for that, we'll have to have banks in the system, which is a bit of a problem because it's regulatory issues. But that's the goal. But short term, in the beginning, it will simply be Alice going to Bob and handing in the money. And then Bob will, in his interface, say, okay, that's fine, she paid me. Okay? That's the one settlement. And the other one, of course, is clearing, which we have here. The fact that, you know, maybe it's not direct, maybe, um, you know, Alice owes Bob, but Bob owes Damien, and Damien owes Alice, and we can. And someday they just wake up and see, oh, it, it, it's gone because the system has done it by itself. Thank you. Okay, one more. Hello, uh, I've got a question. You said that there is, there will be no money, no banks. So the question is how you will benefit from it and how you will earn money by Sikoba. Um, oh, I, I didn't say that there would be no money and no banks. Uh, Sikoba is not a way to uh, replace money or banks. It's a way to complement them. And we do want banks in a system. Okay, we want banks in a system because then people can actually settle. First of all, they can settle in the system using a bank. If you have something like Forex, if you want to do, you know, transact in various currencies, you will probably need a link to the real world. So we want banks in the system. And um, actually, it's a very good question because I, I I've somehow forgot the slide about this. 
we have some ideas uh, about um, the fees. I mean, obviously, there will be fees, and there will be a token uh, to pay these fees. What we are aiming is for these fees to be extremely low. So we are aiming at, a, at mass adoption. We are targeting networks. We're not targeting individual companies to say, hey, we use Sikoba. We want to go to like a town in Bangladesh or in, 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 in Brazil or a network of companies. We want to go to networks, existing networks, to governments, to local governments, and say, hey, you've got 10,000 small companies there. We give you Sikoba for free for two years. Stuff like that. But there will be eventually fees. Our idea there is to say, for a very, very like a basic micro business, it could be, it could be as low as a, 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 a euro or a dollar per year. We want something super, super cheap. And then you know, as a business is bigger, has more, uh, has more, has more business, we want to say for smallish businesses, the range per year should be between one and ten dollars or euros. Okay, it should be ridiculously cheap. That's our goal. But it should be still make a profit for the, for the, for, for the system. It should still cover the costs. Okay. okay, I think that would be the last one. And after that, some announcements. My question is about your proposal uh, about the consensus mechanism. You, you said that uh, this will be something different than uh, proof of work or proof of stake. And I have two questions. First, uh, who will pay for a fee for miners or uh, node holders? And second question is about security or risk analysis, about uh, uh, risk that uh, somebody could uh, hack uh, the network and uh, do some malicious things. Um, okay, for the for the consensus, uh, I'm not quite sure I understood the question because it's not like proof of work, right? This consensus here, because proof of work, you know what you what you're looking for, and as soon as someone finds it, that's it. Here, you don't know what you're looking for. Um, is that? Can you maybe precise again what, what the? Not fully understand about this consensus mechanism because you you are saying that. You, that there is some rate or some oh. percentage or something like that, and how oh. to uh, build security on that. Mechanism. That's yet another thing, um, security. For, for the security in the context of the consensus, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean, how to secure the network. Well, th first of all, these will be all trusted nodes. This, this is a federation, which means you cannot just join. You need to be invited, and everyone knows who the main nodes are. Um, as to the in a consensus um, uh, context, I mean, cheating, th this is a, you have a hard to solve optimization, and the only way to cheat is to, you know, buy hu humongous amounts of processing power, I guess. But then you would, you would get a super solution, but everyone would have to check the solution. I mean, it's, it's hard to, I think it's going to be hard to cheat, okay? Um, if you, it's hard to cheat under constraint, let's put it that way. If one node is, is, uh, is not honest and wants to favor certain participants, okay, that is a constraint. Yeah, it means you need to do something that will actually you eliminate certain solutions because certain solutions will be uh, not as good for this participant. And working in an optimization system under constraint gives you a disadvantage. So in, in a sense, it's a natural balancing, at least in in that sense. Because my question is uh, on base of this trilemma about in, in blockchain, uh, especially about uh, you have to pick uh, two or th three uh, security, uh, scalability, and uh, distribution of that uh, of of, uh, of the system. So but it, do it doesn't apply as it doesn't apply as directly if you if you know the nodes and if you. If these nodes are going to be legally liable, you know, these, these, these guys are going to be, be signing contracts. They're not just there uh, to, to do computations. And they're going to get paid by pa uh, part of the fees. So there'll be an incentive to be a node, but there'll be also a legal liability. So, um, anyway. Okay, I think uh, we can continue the, the talks uh, like after the.
presentation. Um, two more announcements. First of all, there will be a very short presentation by Grzegorz. Um, and after the boards, I would like to invite you for some pizza and some drinks that are behind us. Uh, also on Tuesday, we'll present a little special. Um, we will actually guest Ambrosius, um, a project we have the opportunity to work on, and they will present a little bit about their uh, work. So stay tuned and watch Meetup. Uh, so make some noise for Grzegorz. Is it done? Oh, it's working. Give me a minute. All right. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Greg. Um, so, yeah, I want to tell about the new initiative that we created with uh, four other projects uh, in this, like, Warsaw space, startup space. It's called uh, Blockchain Hub, and uh, we want to create a space where all the blockchain projects can work together and alongside with each other, exchange knowledge, and just cooperate on building on top of blockchain technology. Uh, currently, we are uh, sitting in four projects in Mindspace, Warsaw, at Hala Koszyki, and we want to invite any other projects that are building on top of the blockchain uh, to join us, to visit us, to, I don't know, exchange knowledge, drink coffee, uh, eat lunches, and all the stuff. And tomorrow, uh, we have a kickoff party, uh, party, kickoff meetup uh, with the panel about blockchain beyond technology. We want to talk about social implications of blockchain and what this technology can accomplish uh, in the world. So uh, I would like to invite you, but I got the information that uh, there are no uh, uh, places left. So I'm really sorry about that. Uh, but there is a, like an additional list uh, of participants and we'll be trying to uh, get as many people in uh, as we get information about currently assigned people that they are not going. Uh, so there is still a chance to, to attend that. Uh, but this is not the only uh, meetup that we'll be creating. Uh, there will be more. We don't have a schedule yet, but there will be more. Uh, and I wanted to just list the, the projects that are currently in Blockchain Hub. So there's a MakerDAO. Uh, there's, a, there's this guy uh, at, the, at the back. Like he's, like he's from Maker. Um, uh, there will be a ramp network. There's this smaller guy next to him. That's the ramp network, guys. Uh, there will be me. Uh, uh, we're Cryptoverse. We're, and there's a trivial. Do, there, is anyone from T Trivial here right now? No, the guys didn't come. Oh, lame. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's really short. Uh, I hope that you can get to the, to the kickoff, uh, but uh, uh, you need to try. Uh, and, like, search more. We, I think we have, uh, we don't have a website yet. Do we? No, we don't have a website yet. But as, as soon as there will be a website, there will be uh, more information about what we're doing and what to, we want to uh, achieve with this. Okay, thank you very much. And the pizza, right? Yeah, practically you don't exist if you don't have a website. So yeah, I know. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, enjoy the pizza and let's have some nice networking. See you next time. <laughs>